Today is Pentecost 2024. I reached out to people this week, check in on them. There's a lot of struggle. There were some prank reports, but there were a lot of people really struggling. Bad doctor's reports, upcoming surgery, job stresses, chronic pain. Started thinking about these folks when I sat down in front of the laptop Saturday morning. I was led to the verses we're going to talk about. And then this morning, have you ever just had worry, doubt, and anxiety jump on you like a pack of wolves? I had that this morning about 9 o'clock. Every little thing I could think of, and I know my loving wife didn't notice it, is, uh, but it was... If I could have felt anything I could have felt inadequate about, or I was doing a horrible job, or why hadn't I done this, or it all came in about an hour and a half period. In the shower, all I could think about was stuff I needed to do, stuff I hadn't done, stuff I should have done. And now I was whacked. And I don't really know if they have scripture for being whacked out. But I think if they did, it would be about what we're going to talk about this morning. And I'm sure a lot of us can relate. You know, like I spoke about, like we talked about last week, moms, you held up to a really high standard, tons of stress. Uh, professional folks that are out here, you're balancing home and work and it doesn't seem like you ever make traction on either one. And there are always those things that we want to fix. I know in the healthcare industry, a lot of us are burden bearers and we're fixers. Any burden bearers in this crowd? A few. I know more than a few, a lot of us are. And we want to fix people and we want to fix situations and it can tire us. And where we're at, to where we want to be at are two different places. And it can feel overwhelming. I was feeling some of that this morning. I didn't really understand it at the time, got here, started settling my mind, and I realized that I had a bunch of fiery long darts in my rear end this morning from nine to about 10.30, and I realized need to hear this, and I hope somebody else here does. Pentecost, as recorded in Acts 2, was one of the major turning points in the early church. If you have your Bibles, I'm going to get you to turn to Acts chapter 2. Now, the Apostle Luke wrote the book that bears his name. He also wrote the book of Acts. It's a continuation of where Luke left off. It was kind of put out of um, kind of out of sequence when the New Testament was put together with John being there in the middle, in the middle of it. Now at the beginning of the book of Acts Jesus was about to leave earth return to heaven and in Acts 1 8 he told his disciples but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. You will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, throughout Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth, and he rose up through the clouds to heaven. You ever feel like God's floated away and left you alone? Like we know what the Word says, but it feels so far away from what we're having to deal with. Acts chapter 2, verse 1, when the day of Pentecost had come, they were all together in one place. And we'll talk a little bit about what Pentecost actually is. Because, I'll be honest, I never knew until I, started, until I started in ministry what it actually was. It's a festival. It's also a culture wood. And it occurs about 50 days after Passover, and it's for the end of the barley harvest. A lot of cultures, and these are like culture included, they had festivals around the time that the crops were coming. <clears throat> Israel, in, if you close your eyes and think about Israel, a lot of think about it like desert country, but there are some farmable areas in it. And it's 
the Jewish holiday that commemorates an event in Israel's history, the giving of the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, to Moses at Mount Sinai, is one of the three major or pilgrimage festivals, along with Passover and the um, with uh, Passover and Feast of the Booths or Sukkot, and it requires them to go to the temple in Jerusalem. There, at Mount Sinai, God revealed to the Jewish people his law. In Deuteronomy 4, verses 10 through 13, Moses reminds people of that experience. Remember the day you stood before the Lord your God at Horeb. You came near and stood at the foot of the mountain while it blazed with fire to the very heavens with black clouds and deep darkness, and the Lord spoke. And he declared to you his covenant, the Ten Commandments, which he commanded you followed and wrote them on two stone tablets. It gets its name Pentecost from the Greek 50. The Exodus, which Passover celebrates, marks the beginning of physical freedom for the Jewish people. Physical freedom without spiritual freedom is incomplete. That's what Pentecost represents. The spiritual freedom. In some ways, the battle of the mind is more intense than the battle for the body ever will be. And we need to hear that. We need to. That's what makes this festival so special. Now, to give you an idea, Jesus is gone. There were 120 followers. All that was left of his ministry, they were in one house. Despair is an understatement. What they thought would happen did not happen in the way they understood. And imagine how they must have felt. You have to remember, these folks were still being pursued by Jewish authorities. The Romans had them on the list. <clears throat> Afraid. Alone. Confused. When things don't go like we think they should, or we were just positive it would come out this way. Confused and hurt. And there may be people that feel like that this morning over some over different things. Verse 2, and suddenly they came from heaven, a noise like a violent rushing wind. It filled the whole house where they were sitting. It wasn't a coincidence that Luke described the Holy Spirit like this. In John 3, 8, Jesus said, the wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it. But do not know where it comes from and where it's going. So is everyone who's born of the Spirit. beaten down, depressed. Some of them probably were convinced they would end up on a cross or beaten to death by stoning. The Holy Spirit came in. In verse 3, And there appeared to them tongues as of fire distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. But also find the Holy Spirit came in fire. They didn't hear it. They saw it as well. They heard it. They saw it. They saw fire appear and flame came to each other and rested on it. This, meant, this was something very special, very specific. Exodus 3, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush, it meant that Moses was in the presence of God. Fire, the refining fire, is a symbol that God used in the past and is used in here. Sometimes God moves like the wind. We don't see him, but we know he's there. We feel him. Sometimes he wants to be seen, and the very spirit of God was among them, coming into their hearts. They could see the changes in each one of them. They saw that God was there, and that something was happening. 
it's no coincidence that these people heard and saw the Holy Spirit. It's believers, we're supposed to hear the gospel and speak about Jesus to others. It doesn't have to be fancy for us. Maybe some of the struggle that we're going through right now is that our identities as Christians are very we're very sure of them in here. Maybe our identities as Christians out there we're not so sure of and we don't show as much. And that produces conflict. It produces conflict on our heart. Maybe it's another situation. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's a loss of some kind. Maybe it's a battle you're struggling. Personality, pride, addiction, whatever it is. You're angry at yourself or you're angry at others. You're just, for whatever reason, puts you in that little house. And then the Holy Spirit comes upon you when you think there's just desperation and desolation. These folks, these downtrodden folks, verse 4, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. It goes on, verses 5 through 13. This happened in Jerusalem, and people were from all around the known world there. They spoke Greek, Arabic, Latin, Aramaic. The Jews were speaking, the Jews in that little house were speaking all of it. Egyptian. The people around them could not understand. This was a crowd about probably four or five times the normal population of Jerusalem. And they didn't understand what they were saying and why they were speaking this language that they otherwise would have known. Now some of them, they heard them speaking, they thought they were tore up from the floor up. <laughs> that seems to be a common theme, theme in the Bible that when someone is speaking something that people don't really recognize, they think they've been drinking. And I have to admit, I have heard some folks in the past that Alcohol was the reason why they were speaking the new language, and I probably spoke one or two more, one or two in my day too, back when I did it. Sometimes, though, when we turn our lives over to Jesus, we act differently. It starts from the inside and it goes out. Those people that were around at that time, it may be like a foreign language to them. We start following God's word instead of what the world's telling us. You're going to stand out. And that can be a conflict in its own. It's not fun to stand out sometimes. Make this look very odd to someone who's using the world's rules as their standard was normal. The Holy Spirit can come out of nowhere sometimes. He may not make a sound. He may not make his appearance known. Bible doesn't say it, but this group of believers had to be praying for that spirit that Jesus talked about to come to them. They put their lives into his ministry. Three years following him from place to place. Sure that this would be it. And then he came crashing down. I'm sure some doubt has started seeking in. And sometimes we have that with new Christians. How many of us, after we have turned our lives over to Jesus, did the devil attack him full speed? Everything he had, cars breaking down, appliances breaking down, fur babies getting sick, stuff at work, all these things. I call them spiritual long darts, and I can see why they were outlawed in the 80s because they do not feel good. I have had more hope in my backside in the last seven years than I have in the previous 46. Things that you would not believe, people that come up, I wouldn't trade it for anything, 
but that devil does attack. People may think I am crazy, but it does. And he comes to you not with a pitchfork, not with a pointed tail, but he comes to you with doubt. He comes to you with alternatives. Or I have had periods where I have been praying for people. People chained with addiction. People chained to so many things, but especially with addiction. And I don't know why. I have literally been on my knees praying for those people. And sometimes the Holy Spirit comes to me in the voice. Then other times there are there is that other just feeling. Put it down. Just stop. Put it down. All of disaster, all of the stuff that you have coming to you that is hurting you, all that you will stop if you stop. Probably gonna, some people will probably walk out of here thinking I'm crazy. But, for honest, don't we hear that as well? Just go with the world. Don't stand down. Don't stand down. If you don't do the right thing, just do what's right for you. Think about how easy your life will be. It's so, oh, it is just comforting own way. It is so comforting, and what you know, you can't do it. That's how the devil attacks us. You think he wasn't attacking those people? Bring back in. Come back to the fishing boat. Go to the field. Just go. It's alright. They will look for you. Their ability to speak another language is a very deliberate gift. The church was born to spread the gospel to everyone. Looking at it today, you think the experiences that you have went through were a punishment. You think that they were mistakes. You think that all these they were there to help us speak language. God has us there to help speak the language or understand the language. A person who may have went through addiction can speak that language. A person who has lived with someone with an addiction can help speak that language of what someone's going through. A person who's battled mental illness and has it under control at the moment they know what that person who's struggling with is going through. It's not willpower. It's not, it is chemistry. It is body chemistry. Those who have gone through a divorce, they know what it feels like. And they can speak that language. We may not talk in tongues in the way it was represented here. But doesn't God use our pain to have a silver lining? He didn't cause it, but he can use it to help others. Those who have went through loss, those can help others who are going through it. Holy Spirit's coming in, into this little church. It's always been here. Right here, right now, and it's not quite the direction of the notes I've taken. But I feel like those flames over each one of us, they let us speak the language that someone needs to hear. It may not be within these walls, but there is someone, your family, your work, there is someone that needs to speak just a bit, something. You may be the only one that can speak that language. Someone who is in such pain that they will not respond to anything other than divine help. And guess what? You're it. 
I understand your apprehension when you hear that because I have gone through that. Because I've looked around and that's no fun. It is no fun. But God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things. As we've been talking about this, someone's popped in somebody's mind. Someone who's struggling, someone who that light, they used to light up a room and it's growing dim. God's put it on you. Holy Spirit's put it on your heart. I don't know who it is, but it is somebody. I think I say, Welcome to the club. You may think, I don't know the scripture, it's okay. You don't need to. You know the one that inspired you. And remember, angels did not come. To the educated and to the trained, they came to that field in Bethlehem to announce the good news. Holy Spirit wants to work in and through us. Now, later on in this chapter, Peter, realizing all this stuff's going on, got the other 11 disciples behind him. There was a man by the name of Matthias that took. Jesus' place. He raised his voice and started talking to the crowd and said, Men of Judea and all you who live in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and give heed to my words, for these men are not drunk, as you suppose, for it's only the third hour of the day. I think that's nine o'clock in the morning. And as usual, he had to say everybody was sober. He began to quote Prophet Joel and King David. Joel wrote, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit upon all people. Your sons and your daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. And in those days, I will pour out my spirit, even on my servants, men and women alike, and they will prophesy. Joel was one of the prophets in the last part of the Old Testament. They call them the minor prophets, not because their message was minor, but the amount of writing they had wasn't that much. Y'all, the last part of the Old Testament was a major political disaster for the nation of Israel and the kingdom of Judah. Massive changes were coming. And I feel like We are having the Holy Spirit in ways He's always been here, but I feel like He's reaching out in ways that they haven't in a long, long time. Now I want you to think about this. Peter was illiterate. Ninety percent chance he was. He was a fisherman by trade. And Jesus chose him because of what He saw in Him, not what the world saw in Him. Now, how do we look at ourselves? When we look in a mirror, do we see what we see or do we see what the world sees? Let's be honest. What do we see when we look in the mirror? Is it what God sees? Is it or do we look by someone in a couple pounds? She was kind of tight. Susie looks okay. Like this book. I don't know why Susie. Susie don't look like Susie. Because Susie uses a lot of filters. We base our impression, now kids, you look wonderful. And we base our impression on our self impression. If we think about it, you have some folks who are very confident and they are very self assured. Most of us are not like that. Outside looking in, if you look at Peter, he was a fisherman that couldn't read his own name. And the more you knew about him, he denied Jesus three times. Rand denied him after saying he would die for him. Flawed to the extreme. Guess what? Aren't we all? He started sinking in that lake. 
he had enough faith to step out. Jesus redeemed him. He dropped the charges. Used him to be the foundation of what this church was built on. Look at what he's doing right now. He's allowing the Holy Spirit to speak through him. And amazing things are happening. And after Peter finished speaking, the crowd asked, what should we do? And I'll tell you something, this answer still applies today. Mobile or sell. How many of us want God and we want Jesus, but we want him on our terms? Humble yourself. And when I say yourself, I mean me too. Because I, I put in an order at times. I want extra grace, extra mercy, extra direction. But I don't want you saying say anything mean to me. There have been like that. I mean, and, and I'll be the person, man, I can be like that at times. A pastor who gets up and tells you that they have it all together and they start talking, you, 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 it always needs to be we, we, us. We're all hot messes. We're going through this life together. Repenting your sins. Repentance is the key to salvation. That's something that's been taken out of a lot of churches. But when we sin, that's bad, that's wrong. We cannot avoid sinning altogether, but we can sure make it better. We can try and do the right thing. Some days we'll do better than others. But ask for forgiveness. When you know it's wrong. Accept Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the light. He's not a spare tire. In times of trouble. We need to carry him out that door. He needs to be our compass. Be humble enough and willing to listen and follow God's plans that are ours and his. Oh boy, I've had such nice plans in the past. I have. And they have been wrecked. Oh, like a house of cards in a fan store. They have just been wrecked and destroyed and yeah. glad some of them work because it led me to something a lot better. A lot better than I ever thought possible. Verses 41 and 42. So then those who had received this word were baptized and that day were added by 3,000 souls. They were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and prayer. Pentecost was the turning point for the church. Those 120 huddled, defeated, hopeless souls became a group of 3,000 in a single day. These 120 believers, they weren't special. They were ordinary people just like us. No Christian then or now is perfect. There's been one perfect person in this whole world, the history of it. He came, he lived, he died for us. They struggled at times after Pentecost, like we all struggle at times. Their tempers can run hot, their faces can run cold. But he kept trying to do better. Each day he kept trying to do better according to the Word of God, direction of the Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit wants to work in our lives, doing God's work and growing His kingdom. And sometimes it can feel odd to say a prayer, especially when you're first starting off. Father, your priorities, set the priorities in my life. Help us to do your work, Father. Be a part of your kingdom because we're human. We think, well, what's in it for us? God's not going to leave us. When He thinks about His plans, so above my head. When you pray to do his work, the work he has according to his plan for your life, he's not going to leave you out of the Jeremiah 29 11. He talked about all the stuff that those folks would have to go through. But he promised them.
told me they had to spend 70 years in Babylon. That when 70 years for Babylon are complete, I will attend you and will confirm my promise concerning you to restore you to this place, for I know the plans I have for you. This is the Lord's declaration, plans for your well-being, not for disaster, to give you a future in the hope. Doing God's work is not the job of the pastor. It's not the job of the board. It's job of all of us who claim to be believers. Our mission may be one person that we know that is in danger of eternal separation from God. That's the true hell. Even in our worst moment in this world, God is still there. Hell is the separation where God is completely gone in your life. I will tell you something. You may look and you may say, well, one person. There are people standing up here in these pulpits 30, 40 years that can never say that. Ask for the Holy Spirit to use you to let you be able to speak to this person and understand them. If you go to prayer, I want to ask that you pray for a modern-day Pentecost, a renewal of Jesus' church. Not just here at Genesis, but with the rest of the churches. We're not, it's not a competition. It's not. Anybody that finds a better spiritual home that meets their needs, we're happy for them. All of God's houses need renewal. They all do. It doesn't matter. Catholic, Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Nazarene, whatever it is, we need renewal. Power of darkness are growing. If you don't look at it, if you don't believe that, don't take my word for it. Just look. When you got young men being killed, not more than what, five miles from here? Over probably some assumed disrespect or something like that. And I don't know what caused it. 17 year olds should be getting ready for the prom. Mom's and dad should be getting ready there. Darkness is growing. And we have to pray and we have to that God's church will grow and we have to pray to be a part of that. Because if we aren't, we will be. Now I don't mean the buildings and the walls we could have, and I want us to grow physically, but we could have an 800 person church here if the Holy Spirit's not here. We're not carrying. The message, the word outside these walls, y'all, we're, we're doing no one any good. Let's pray the Holy Spirit will equip us and lead us to help others to come to Jesus through our lives, our actions, and our words. Don't beat them over the head with the body. Just be you. Be you. Be that light. And they'll come to May not be words to say, but listen, you never know the power that can have. And let's pray that we can help just one people, one person come to Jesus or return to him. One person, then they help one person. And imagine a world where everybody just helps somebody. Y'all, let's stand. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we come to you. Father, Man, what is become to you like that 120 followers? Father, we look at this world and we just don't even know where to start. Maybe we're looking at someone in our family. Maybe it's us and we don't know what to do, where to start. Father, use the Holy Spirit. Work through Him to work through us. Make your priorities our priorities. Father, when people see us, let them see Father, we don't have all the answers all the time. We don't know the direction we need to go in. Lead us all in our words, our hands, our actions, our thoughts. Give us wisdom. Give us discernment. Please, Father, help us all to help and be part of your kingdom and to do the work that you call each one of us to do. Father, prepare us and put us. 
help us to help someone, whatever that is. Father, help us to turn the 120 into 3,000, not for numbers, but for salvation. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.